Aloha and uh, welcome to the state of the state of Hawaii on Think Tank Hawaii, its live streaming network series. I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. I'm sure you've noticed there are many signs about, about town indicating the Honolulu city and county mayor's race is on and it is accelerating to the point of recognizing finalists. Today, we have one of the finalists right here. I'm pleased to introduce city council member for District 1, Kimberly Pine, who was in her first race for mayor. Welcome, Kim. Aloha. And, and thank you for joining Think Tech today to share more specifically, presumably, about your campaign and your goals and aspirations. Um, and may I call you Kim for our conversation? Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, the last time you graciously participated on the show, it was early in the year and early in the campaign. And it was also pre-COVID-19 time. Well, times have certainly changed. You, though, have succeeded many, many times on the campaign trail, um, even, even though this is your first run for mayor, but you've, you've got a great track record. But given the times we are in, the playing field seems more level for all the candidates because no one has governed in such uh, crisis times as this now, and nor have they managed uh, under the sad losses and brutal effects of, uh, of a pandemic. So this prompts my first question to you, is how has the emergence of COVID-19 influenced and or changed your campaign and your priorities for serving as mayor of Honolulu City County? Well, we announced pretty much earlier in the year that we're considering of course, running for mayor, but I'll be honest with you, I'm the only elected official that's running for this mayor seat right now. And so the crisis was was so big that I just stopped campaigning. It was just impossible to help thousands and thousands and thousands of people without just stopping. And I just felt that it was inappropriate to campaign while people were suffering and they're still suffering now. It's just that you almost have to campaign now because the vote is coming up. And so we didn't really start uh, campaigning until the first week of June when we had to make the final announcement. But at the same time, uh, we're still, half of my time is still being used to help my constituents, especially, and now people all over the island because they're meeting me, they're asking me to help them with their issues, like trying to get their unemployment benefits. Some pe people still have not gotten their unemployment benefits. People who are independent contractors have not got their unemployment benefits, despite the governor announcing that they will be considered uh, for benefits many months ago. Uh, I'm talking to people that have zero dollars in their bank account. And they're like, Kim, how do I pay rent? How do I get food? And it's not just one person, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that I'm talking to. And of course, I had some of the highest cases of COVID in my district. And so we were also battling health issues, people afraid spreading it to each other. And so the anxiety level is still very high for different things right now. And so I would have to say I'm not completely campaigning like I would have in a non-COVID period. Normally, an elected official would take some time off. We're pretty much still serving every single day and helping people. And hopefully if we have time, we're campaigning too. And so my team is really stretched thin, but we're very inspired because when we are talking to people out there, we are motivated more than ever knowing that we are the right team to go into the mayor's office because we really all come from the working class. I'm running against millionaires and these famous politicians who this really is a business for them, right? They get in, they award their friend contracts, their family members get these contracts, and this is a business. But for me, I'm a mom. I'm a working class mom that wants government to work for the regular person. And so that's really what we bring to the table and have done during this campaign and then also during the pandemic. Well, you're, you're uh, in the front row. See, <laughs> the, the, 
the impact. Uh, that is horrific, really, to have to deal with that every day. So um, thank you, and thank you, staff. How wonderful for the people that are assisted. I And I know you can't even do them all. I, I can't even ask about that. It's too bad. But hopefully, we'll, somehow Hawaii will embrace it all. Um, you know, you said um, that you are the only candidate that is currently um, in public service. Um, but you've also said that uh, you, this has allowed you to study um, the complexities of governing um, for quite a while. I, I think I've heard something like six or seven years, something like that, and enough to know how to do the mayor's job very well. Now, would you share an example of um, the kind of government complexity that you would have you know, been looking at for quite a while or trying to process or, or, or grasp in certain ways? Uh, a little bit about that to us and um, and then how you think that prepares you for uh, dealing with the COVID-19 situation. Well, I have an additional job being the representative of the second city in Kapolei. So I'm also not just doing my city council job, but I'm building a second city as an executive, deciding how which streets we connect, how the sewer lines are gonna be put in where the job centers are gonna be attracting new businesses and convincing them to come to my district to really truly create a second city. And I'll give you an example. So when Hawaii Medical West uh, just shut down all of a sudden many years ago, 400 people, this is where Queens Medical Center West is now. Uh, we had a huge tragedy because 400 of my own constituents were out of work right away. And so we, of course, uh, went into emergency status and we did everything we could to get unemployment benefits for these people. We did everything that we could to get them food and financial assist assistance. But also what we did next is we started the first hire labor job fair where we helped these people to find jobs close to home. And since then, we've done one every year and we've helped 6,000 people get jobs close to home. So it's really looking at the bigger picture of, of, of how do you help someone live a better life here on, in this city? And so 6,000 people who used to drive to town every day for two to four hours a day now, that's how much it takes for us Leeward re sure. residents mm -hmm. to get to town. You know, now I've created a life for them where they just drive down the street. One woman who used to go to all Moana from from, from a Makakilo every day for 20 years, she said, Kim, and she got a job at a, ho a new hotel that I helped bring in um, down the street in the city of Kapolei. She says, Kim, for the first time in 20 years, I get to have dinner and watch the sunset with my husband. Joy. I can't tell you how your type of leadership has helped better my life and all these others. And so when I talk about the complicated system of government, um, it's nothing like the state capital. The state capital is kind of like this abyss of philosophies, right? You, 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 you debate the philosophy of how to debate a, um, educate a child, right? And the, whereas a city, it's everything that works and doesn't work. It's like, is your park working for you? Are things fixed? And a lot of times when I first got in, it was like, no. <laughs> Does the sewers work? Do the transportation systems work? It's it's very different. It's very on hand, a hands on, very different from state government or federal government. And then when it comes to businesses, and so I, I, I'm amazed that, that there's two candidates, uh, candidate Amia and Blangeri, think that they can just bring their business experience to government. They're used to seeing, for example, okay, we're not making money in this division, so we're just going to cut that whole division. So when you come to the city, you're going to say, we're not making money in this division. So let's just get rid of all the lifeguards and all the ambulances, right? You can't do that in, in, in government. This is not a business. This government fulfills what businesses cannot do. And, and they're used to just saying, this is my decision. We're going to go for it. But in government, if you want to change anything in the budget, you have to have five public hearings on it. But in addition to that, you have to have all these different meetings with all our different departments, go back into the community, and then from the mayor's office, propose a decision to the city council, then the city council has to go through five public hearings. So the final budget is not what that executive dictator said he wants to do. 
it's something in between that the public decided together and had input on. Very different than a business. That's very clear. Uh, that's an, uh, the complexity issue. I, I noticed that you used that word in one of your, uh, maybe it was the interview, I was looking at some of your, your um, videos. And, uh, and I thought, well, that's an interesting word to use for the city government. And now I understand a lot better what you meant. And of course, it's not just networking, but I mean, in their rules. Okay, so that is very helpful. So um, now I had said also to tie it into COVID-19, I think it's obvious how that connects given um, the requirements to um, network and bring in um, multi-dimensional views and, and that sort of thing. But I also wanted to ask you about the concerns you expressed about rail. And um, I, uh, I, I'm, you were saying that it's a system that you thought was too big for a small town like Honolulu. Um, I noticed that. And then um, it also presented too large a temptation for miscreants and uh, mm -hmm. looking the other way in the face of all, all of that uh, uh, complicated uh, contracting and, and money flow, et cetera. So um, you said you also received reports and there are federal uh, concerns about irregularities in the project's contract. I wanted to ask me, you know, as the mayor, what, what as you actually are the mayor, um, what alternatives would you study or attempt to use to fix the, the project? Okay. You know, I assume, in other words, projecting yourself into it. So, uh just so I'm clear, so in 2005, when I was in the House of Representatives, I voted against the funding mechanism to go ahead and start the rail project. And the reason I voted against it is because first, Mupi Hanneman came to the legislature, says I need a 1% general excise tax increase to go directly to the rail project to build it on time, on budget, and everything will be completely paid for when we're done with it. This will be the first project in the history of Hawaii that everything will be paid for when we're finished. Of course, yeah. I had great suspicions about that because three months later, after he introduced it to the legislature, he suddenly said, oh, we just need 0.5%. So we don't need the whole 1%. And so I was like, did the project cost get cut in half just overnight? Uh, where are your cost projections? Um, how did you come up with this cost? Does it include all utility lines underneath? Does it include rail cars? And, and no one gave me any answers. And of course, the answer we know today is no, it didn't include utility relocations. It did not include rail car costs, which is a huge cost within the project. Uh, it didn't include debt service or contingency funds should mistakes happen. And so from the get-go, the, the, the numbers to the project was just a sham, and, and, and I had that hunch in 2005, even though I was told that it was suicide for me to vote against it as a leeward representative, I knew that I would be attacked, and it was the hardest re-election after that, but I, I was elected by my constituents to tell the truth and to, to, to let them know the truth, and so unfortunately, everything that I said back then where I had concerns came true. And so now when I say, I believe that our town is too small, it's too small in a sense that how Hart was developed and created under the Hanneman administration, it was to make Hart separate. It means I have no oversight. The mayor has no oversight in terms of like our power according to the law that they created to create Hart. So what I was saying is, too many people were looking the other way when bad things were happening. And I know this because staff would call me, lower level staff would call me. And I remember one time I was about to meet this one important engineer overlooking the project. He says, Kim, they aren't following any of the laws. They aren't following procurement law. They're giving, they're giving contracts be, um, uh, illegally and, and they're using small loopholes to explain themselves doing these things like for example they will extend a contract to someone or give an, another additional job to a contractor when they're supposed to actually put that new job out for procurement to go in a fair process so these are just examples and I remember I was supposed to meet with this one engineer and he got fired the next day and then he had to go get some mental health <laughs> help because he was so distraught he had a ton of kids and he had to pay his bills and find another job and went to the mainland 
And um, I have so many examples of, of, of different employees getting fired or, or their contract not renewed shortly after they brought up a lot of um, concerns. And of course, what the council then did, seeing all these irregularities ourselves, we did the first audit, which of course led to another audit and then the federal FBI investigation of rail. So it's, it's really, they also believed that there's irregularities and possible criminal behavior. So it's not just me saying this, but now I have a federal entity that's saying the same thing. So being that we already built most of it, right, or half of it, what do you do? If we do proceed, right now we don't have money because of COVID, it's just the reality and you have to just be honest with people about it so that they know what to expect in the future. But should we have money in the future, I will demand as mayor that, that, that we have federal investigation investigators there every day within the staff of heart to make sure that all the laws are followed. And that will ensure an open, honest, transparent type of government and building that we really need in this project right now. So uh, you would need to see a change in, in the, the context of the work. I mean, having the FBI and the feds there a lot. Yes. Yes. You're talking about oversight yeah. and you're talking about small town like Honolulu being just not, not, not organized for the kind of or oversight that you need to run these contracts and to look after all of the modifications and the change orders and those sorts of things that open up these um, miscreants opportunities, I suppose that's one way. But anyway, I, I think um, that's, uh, that's an interesting story, Kim. And then what about if we don't, I mean, my next question is actually about the budget and the decimated condition of it mm -hmm. to the, billions and all of the needs um, uh, that we have as a result of the shutdown economy. I know that, uh, you know, you've talked about investing in the economy, uh, but what really does, what really does that mean? I mean, I, um, what, maybe I'll just stop with that. What, what does that mean to invest in the economy when you've got a huge deficit like that? and looming huge enormously expensive projects like rail and then not to mention human uh, needs you have to set oh, money sorry. aside to fix the problem not just survive the problem and i think in in any type of tragedies that we've had or shortfalls that we've had in the in the past we've just looked to survive from the problem because this problem was caused in Hawaii by over tourism. When I say problem, the, the crash of the economy in Hawaii, no other state is suffering the way we are because no other state put all of their eggs in one basket in terms of making tourism the leader of our economy and such a large part of our economy. So for all the CARES Act money that came from the federal government, um, what I have proposed is half of that CARES Act, and it's almost $400 million, half of that, of course, go to surviving this moment, making sure people are fed, making sure that they have enough money to pay rent so, or, or their mortgage so that they have food over their head, right? And then That's a quarter not, of that, what's with that? Not very much money, actually. <clears throat> it's not very much money, but it's enough for now. Right, we're going to have another stimulus very soon. We haven't even spent like a quarter of the money it's oh. from the city side. the The state, however, has over a billion point four. According to Brian Schatz, we have four billion. I, I haven't seen the breakdown of that. The state has a lot more, and I'm suggesting the same formula to them, and for the city and the state, um, the mayors as well as the governor to work together to make sure we're not doubling things when we should just be uniting all of our money. So another quarter should be to beefing up our healthcare system, right? And making sure that we're safe. We have test trackers, we have we have isolation areas and buildings people can go to to separate from their families. And then the next quarter should be to be investing into getting us out of this or re making us resilient and making sure this never happens again. So that would be for new economies to work on. Well, I wanted to ask about your, 
you're addressing the, the issue of the state having a lot of money. And of course they have many expenses too, but, um, and deficits too. But how do you, how do you see yourself in that, that problem solving with the state as the mayor? That what do you think you bring to that, that, that really can make a difference? Because it seems like that is gonna be a source is the state, not the only, but that is a source funding that maybe hasn't been tapped much in the past as it needs to be tapped now yeah the state has actually spent no money there as you know the 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 legislature did do their budget and now it's up to the governor to decide what to do with those monies except the state put a lot the, the state legislature put a lot of the money into the rainy day fund which the governor has no control over but the state legislature does so i'm a little confused of who's going to spend the money how they're going to spend the money but the money's still there that's uh, but, news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's sad. It's still there because people are starving, and that should a lot of that money should have been released already to help them with a lot of those things. But that's a whole another yeah. topic. Um, but this is where collaboration. What I'm really good at is bringing people who are very different together. Needs to happen more than ever. The mayor and the governor the legislature, the state legislature, the city council, we have to really just come together and look at all these different pockets of money where, where money is needed to, br to bring the money there. Um, whether it's healthcare, whether it's human services, is it transportation, is it daycare, is it just food, is it rental payments, mortgage payments? Uh, there should be a lot of collaboration between the leaders to make sure that that we are efficiently spending all the money coming in. Um, those are, um, that that's enormous resource, it seems. I mean, I don't know how much of that is already in play currently. I mean, I, I like like you've mentioned, uh, some of these things are, are there to use, tools to use that are not in play at this time. And that would be a part of the skill set you would bring is ways yeah. to think, about, especially having been in those other, places of the government to know those kinds of things that as a very encouraging. Um, the other question I wanted to ask about tourism had to do with um, um, the ideas and, uh, and, and policies you could set or um, the um, experiences that you've had. I, I, I think you've mentioned that the, um, the income of the people that work in the tourism industry mm -hmm. that I think I've heard you it the, the opposite of dire. In fact, that that maybe has kept up somewhat with inflation, or that people are compensated already. I mean, so that we that actually we have a workforce that has a compensation that is acceptable. I mean, everybody wants and would like to give more, and maybe that could come. But is that what you're saying? Is that that is kind of set, and that there are other things that could be attended to? Or no, I certainly would like them to have more. Uh, because inflation has and, and the cost of living here is so high. And so what I would like to do is make sure that they have better benefits, better protections. Any, any mm -hmm. person that worked for a non-union hotel, I would say 50, per, no, 60 per, percent of them lost their jobs and had no health care benefits at all. Just a few non-union hotels gave make sure that people had health care benefits especially during covid right they, that's a really important thing but the rest of the employees they, they had everything cut including their health care and so what i'd like to do for resilience in the future is make sure that money is aside to help people should this happen again and that would be something that we would require hotels to do to make sure that we have resilience with their workers um, but it's why i've made uh, fighting for affordable housing and solving homeless issues and and how to build home housing for the homeless a top priority because 60 percent of most working class families go to housing and that's very high in comparison to america it's really supposed to be 30 percent of your income goes to housing and then that shows a healthy family income but i don't know anybody you know unless you're very wealthy that has that 30 percent of you know going to only housing it's usually a lot more and so i really focused on passing on numerous legislation we built over 4,000 affordable housing units with some um, as low as 500 dollars a month 
I was very excited to give a key to a mom who's in a domestic violence shelter for her, two bedroom for her and her kid for $600 a month. I mean, you can't find that in Hawaii. And it was a brand new unit that I fought to be built for, for low income residents. She had a full time job, but she just suffered a lot of different things. And so it's really not just what you make, it's how you can create opportunities to lower the cost of living for the people. And that's really my specialty. What about uh, under tourism and uh, the, the, the golden goose uh, in, a, in a way um, of Waikiki and all of those uh, multinational hotels that really are not dependent on their, the income from Waikiki to keep the whole chain afloat. So as mayor, and maybe, maybe mayor doesn't do so much, maybe it's a state thing, but how can they participate more in the restoration of our community. Is that something um, that you see as doable or is that not within the purview of this office? Well, they can help in many ways. Uh, tourism will come back, but of course I'm pushing tourism of the 80s where we had half the number of people here, but the same income. So that meant we, we targeted higher spending tourists. I would like to see the hotels become a good partner in going back to that type of tourism where we really just focus on the high end tourism where people were paid a lot more because their services had to be more because you're, you are taking care of a wealthier population oh, and nice. services were better. And then your healthcare is better also. And so there's a lot of things that have happened in the eighties. We used to have a lot of locally owned businesses where they really knew personally a lot of their employees so they really had the heart to take care of them now you have these investment REITs that are owning most of these hotels there's very few local ownerships unless it's like a single tiny hotel and so you've lost that connection I would do what I can as mayor to give some type of tax benefits and credits to hotels that recognize the value of our worker here and take good care of them and perhaps make sure that the ownership is here or at least have an important owner living here part-time so they can actually feel close to their their employees um do you think that that's a a, a significant chunk of the problem or or not i mean is that is that kind of that work a big piece of um the, the need to help the economy. Um, I'm, I mean, I was thinking that it was, I just wanted to know if you think it is or where does it sit there in putting the pieces back together to get the economy thriving again? Well, being able to handle the virus is gonna get the economy thriving. People aren't gonna travel if they think they're gonna get the virus. And so that's why in March, I was the first elected official to say the only way for tourism to survive is if we pre-test tourists before they get on a plane, it's not, it's not 100%, but at least the person sitting in the airplane will feel a little more confident that the person next to them likely doesn't have COVID because they were tested. Unless you do that, people aren't going to fly. Um, you have a lot of different people that um, you know, want to come here, but they need to feel safe. For example, in 9-11, we had a huge hit to our, our, our tourism because people didn't want to be on a plane that was going to be used for a weapon to destroy a building or to kill people. And so it wasn't until the airports and the, the airplanes helped people to feel safe by adding more security measures and pre-checks. So it's very much the same. You pre-test people. And then in terms of getting the higher spending tourists, that is something that we need to have a larger conversation within the tourism industry with state and city elected officials is, what were we doing back in the 80s that attracted that high interest? Let's go back to that strategy to begin with. Um, has that received much feedback, that notion of, of backing up to a more exquisite, exclusive venue situation here? Has that, uh, I haven't heard, I mean, uh, not that I know everything, but is that your notion or I mean, has, have people been talking about that? Getting well, since I've been talking about it, I've been talking about it for a year and a half now before COVID even happened. And now every mayor candidate is saying what came out of my mouth a year and a half ago. And everyone said, ah, Kim, 
we don't need to do that. We make so much money. We don't care. Stop attacking tourism. And I would say, I'm not attacking tourism. I just, I want my, my beach back. You know, you can't, you, before COVID, you couldn't even go to Kailua without even feeling like you were, you were just at a pool at a hotel. It was, it, it was very different from when I was a child. And then you go to the North Shore, same thing. And then it was people starting to go to Waianae and, and all these other places that used to be such a beautiful place to go, very calm, was just being overtaken. And then again, as I told you, when you look at the financial numbers, we had double the people here crowding all of our areas, making it more expensive for locals to upkeep our roads and our sewers our bathrooms, because they were just being overused by tourists. And we had double the people, but half the benefit. Well, Cammie, if you um, uh, look to the end of your mayoral term, be it one or two, um, can you share your, your um, notion of what outcome will be there as you leave the office, as you're closing the door behind you, what one or two outcomes will actually be in play here in the in Hawaii that uh, you'd like to share well, for the working class family like me I'm the only working class candidate I'm running against millionaires and famous people that the least they make is three hundred thousand dollars a year I know what it's like to have hardship here as a mom as a wife as a working class family that I have made it my mission to make Oahu more affordable. We will build those 22,000 units that we need of affordable housing so that people can live comfortably here. I've already helped to build 4,000 in my eight years on the Honolulu City Council. Does it include the thousands that I've helped to, to get built in my district when I was in the House of Representatives? I have another 4,000 coming through different pieces of legislation that I've passed, um, half the, the affordable housing that I put in motion didn't include a single taxpayer dollar. It's all by putting together building formulas that increase density within a building and give some, allows a developer to make profit. But I say, hey, I want a little bit back for you to build affordable housing for me for free. And I want it for 30 years affordability. I foresee us having an incredible healthcare system where if anyone is sick, that we can find out right away if they have a, a particular virus, who they came in contact with, alert those people and tell them, hey, if you want to isolate from your family, we have these different buildings that used to be hotels in Waikiki that we've converted to isolation areas where we'll give you your food, your water, what you need while you isolate from your family so you don't start a cluster in just your area. I envision our roads being beautiful and in and, 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 and an efficient as well as ethical government and a resilient economy. Well, that is a list of outcomes. And I can go on and on. <laughs> we will look forward to every one of them and it's aloha time for us now and uh, we'll have to wrap it up. Um, I'm Stephanie Stoll Dalton. This is the state of the state of Hawaii on the thick tech live streaming network series. And we've been uh, talking with Kimberly Pine, the candidate, a finalist candidate for uh, Honolulu City and County Mayor. Um, I'll see you all again in two weeks on the next State of the State of Hawaii and uh, mahalo for your attention. Aloha, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. It's been a pleasure. Thank